For 100 years, Standards Australia has endeavoured to protect Australians. We have strived to provide procedures and guidelines for safe practices, reliable buildings and quality ingredients. For 100 years, we have worked to build a community with one purpose – a better, safer Australia. For 100 years, we have grown international relationships and sought to show the benefits of standards at home and abroad. So what does the next 100 years look like for Standards Australia? What will our purpose and promise be? We will carve out new and better ways to do things. We will stay focused on the pioneering of emerging industries. We will ensure we are looking forward, developing and encouraging new technologies to our shores. We will continue to innovate and transform. We will work to develop the next generation of contributors to reflect the true diversity of the country we inhabit. We will continue to work to protect Australians in their everyday lives. Hello everyone. Welcome to this Standards Australia webinar on the ASNZS 5601 Part 1 2022 Gas Installation Standards. We're delighted so many of you have been able to join us here. Uh, my name is John Munya. I am the Engagement Manager here at Standards, looking after energy, oil, mining, and importantly, the gas sectors. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we are all working from today, and to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people participating in this webinar. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. The uh, ASNZS 5601 part one uh, 2022 standard is a key standard for gas installations in Australia and New Zealand. This standard sets out requirements for designing, installing and commissioning gas installations used with natural gas, LP gas and biogas. Uh, following this presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions with regards to the standard and the presentation. Do please keep in mind that the information in this session is intended as general information only and not formal advice. We are able to provide an overview of the standard, but if you have any specific business needs, please refer to the full standard, uh, which can be found through our various distribution channels. <coughs> If there are any additional questions outside of the webinar, please do get in touch with me. Uh, my details can be found um, at the Standards Australia website under the gas sector. Moving on to our main presentation, I'm really excited to be joined by Enzo Alfonsetti. Um, Enzo started his career in the manufacturing sector in the research and development of both gas and electric cooking appliances and ducted gas heaters. He later went on to work as a senior testing officer and NATA signatory in the gas appliancing testing laboratory before working for SIA Global in the certification of type A gas appliances and gas components, where he became the gas certification scheme program manager. Since 2010, he has worked for Energy Safe Victoria and in his current role of the head of type A gas appliance and component safety, and over the next fortnight is also the Acting Director of Regulatory Operations. He holds a degree in Mechanical Engineering, is the Chair of the Gas Technical Regulator Committee, and also the Chair of AG006, the Gas Installations Committee. Thank you very much and welcome Enzo. Thank you, John. Uh, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Loud and clear, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thank you to, to you and to Standards Australia for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this evening on uh, the recent, uh, or not so recent, I guess, revision of uh, ASNZS 5601 Part 1. Um, the standard was published in uh, uh, September 2022. In fact, it was the 30th of September 2022. Um, in many jurisdictions, including in Victoria, there was a six-month transition period 
uh, for the implementation of the standard. Um, and there were a number of reasons uh, for that, um, which I won't go into uh, detail this evening. But uh, I guess, you know, depending on which part of Australia you're, you're viewing this from, um, it would be uh, prudent to check with your local regulator as to uh, the implementation date for this standard. Um, so, as you can see there, uh, there's a little bit of uh, information. John's already uh, provided a, a, a nice bio on myself. Um, I'm the current chair of the Gas Technical Regulators Committee, and I am also the chair of the Standards Australia AG6 Committee, which is responsible for this standard ASNZS 5601 Part 1. And in fact, we're meeting tomorrow and Wednesday, so we have our next technical meeting tomorrow. So this is very timely, actually. So a bit of an overview uh, of what I'll be talking about uh, this evening. Um, there's some new definitions uh, in the 2022 edition. Um, there's a, a reformatting of Section 2, um, where we've separated the essential safety requirements and performance-based requirements. Uh, there are new requirements for multi-layer pipe. Uh, there's a requirement around uh, brazing um, within uh, one metre of a, a joint that is non-metallic. Uh, there are new drawings for consumer piping located in cavities. There's an increased clearance requirement uh, between domestic cookers and range hoods. Uh, there is a restriction on the use of semi-rigid connectors um, for the installation of commercial catering equipment. Prohibition on fluing into the roof space uh, in Australia, which essentially aligns us with New Zealand. Um, new requirements for the protection of combustible surfaces adjacent to commercial catering equipment. New pipe sizing graphs and tables. Um, there's a bit of information now on the effect of altitude on gas supply pressure in high rise building installations. Uh, there are revised requirements and diagrams for the loca location of flue terminals uh, under covered areas uh, or in recesses or balconies. New requirements for the isolation of installations in educational institutions and commercial kitchens. Um, there are new requirements for freestanding commercial catering equipment with under equipment connection. Uh, new requirements for the connection of freestanding commercial catering equipment using a hose assembly. And finally, uh, there's some new information relating to commercial catering equipment clearances to grease filters. So firstly, with regards to definitions, um, so there are uh, a few definitions of which I've picked out two for this evening's presentation uh, in the revised standard, uh, the first of which is a fire safety system. Uh, this is straight out of the National Construction Code that is administered by the Australian Building Codes Board. So a fire safety system is one or any combination of the methods used in a building to warn people of a fire emergency, provide for safe evacuation, restrict the spread of fire or extinguish a fire. And it includes both active and passive systems. So that definition is straight out of the National Construction Code. Um, and a little bit later on in the presentation, you'll understand why that definition has been introduced. We also have a new definition for what an ignition source is. Uh, so a source of energy that can ignite an explosive atmosphere. Uh, and we do have a note uh, that provides some further clarity. Ignition sources include, but not, uh, not limited to, flames, incandescent material, electric sparks, hot surfaces, and mechanical impact sparks. So as I mentioned uh, during the overview, um, section two of the standard, uh, historically, in section two, we have had the performance-based uh, design requirements and some essential safety requirements mixed together. And that occurred back in 2010 when the standard, which was previously an, an Australian-only standard, uh, it was known as AS5601 prior to 2010, 
in uh, 2010, uh, it was uh, split into two parts and became a joint Australian-New Zealand standard. So um, we've got ASNZS5601 Part 1, which we're talking about, I'm talking about tonight, and there's also Part 2, which is for installations in caravans and boats. So at that time, we had the performance-based requirements and essential safety requirements uh, uh, all covered off in Section 2. What we decided to do, because the essential safety requirements were somewhat prescriptive, um, we felt that it was necessary to create subsections in Section 2 um, so that we could uh, separate those requirements that were purely performance-based from the requirements that were deemed essential safety requirements but were uh, uh, prescriptive rather than performance-based. Um, many of the changes that you're going to see in the revised uh, version of 5601 Part 1 relate to multi-layer pipe. Um, and, and this is predominantly because of what we uh, as regulators have seen out in the field. So one of the main changes uh, relates to the installation of multi-layer pipe uh, above ground external to a, a building. So uh, we are no longer allowing for multi-layer pipe, as you can see there in those photographs, to be installed uh, such that it is uh, exposed to UV damage or uh, even mechanical damage. Now, the previous standard did talk about providing um, some protection uh, for UV uh, and also for mechanical damage. Um, but as you can see from this slide here, this is a photograph of multi-layer pipe. This was given to me by the uh, gas technical regulator in South Australia. It was actually protected with some uh, plastic sleeving that had a slit in it so that you could basically put the sleeving over the multi-layer pipe. And what you can see there is that uh, UV degradation through the actual slit in the protective sleeving uh, that was uh, designed to protect the piping. So it just shows you that even with some form of protection, uh, it, it didn't guarantee that the uh, outer polyethylene sheath of the multi-layer pipe was being protected. Uh, that example uh, occurred over a 15 month period. So it just shows you it doesn't take very long if you've got multi-layer pipe uh, exposed to sunlight, um, the sort of damage that, that you can do with, um, with uh, ultraviolet um, radiation. So there's two relevant clauses, clause 5212, consumer piping above ground external to buildings must now be metallic and extend at least one metre into a building. And clause 5316, uh, multi-layer piping shall not be installed above ground external to a building. Um, the photographs on the screen, again, examples of what we've seen out in the field and um, justification for some of the changes uh, that we've implemented. Um, so uh, starting from the top left-hand corner, uh, that's a photo of a solar inverter uh, that uh, caught fire and there was some multi-layer pipe uh, adjacent to that solar inverter, which sub subsequently caught fire and melted, uh, further fueling the fire. Um, the photograph uh, in, the, in the middle at the top there uh, is an example of where there's multi-layer pipe uh, that was uh, rubbing uh, against some uh, electrical wiring. Uh, there was some arcing occurring there and uh, uh, resulting in damage to the piping. Um, the photograph to the right uh, is one that was sent to me just recently by one of the regulators and is quite disturbing. Apparently, that is uh, multi-layer piping that was eaten through by rats. Um, so, hence, there's a real concern that um, it isn't very common uh, that we see this sort of thing. So, as I say, uh, this is the first time um, that I've seen multi-layer pipe uh, for gas being chewed through by rats. But nevertheless, this is uh, the evidence that we've been provided in recent times. 
Uh, the photograph to the in the bottom left hand corner again it relates to um, an electrical fire, and you can see the multi layer pipe there on the left hand side that's been damaged. Um, and the the photo in the bottom centre is probably the most interesting of all. Uh, this relates to an incident that actually occurred in Victoria. Uh, what it shows is uh, a transition from copper press fit on the left-hand side uh, to multi-layer pipe on the right-hand side. Uh, what happened in this instance is that there was a fire uh, and, in fact, re resulting in an explosion. Uh, firefighters uh, attended the scene. Um, what you can see there is that the uh, where the press fit, copper press fit transitions to the multi-layer pipe uh, where that joint occurs, uh, that the piping or the joint has melted. Uh, we actually were able to cut away that section of piping and have it tested under laboratory conditions. Um, and so what we found was with the multi-layer pipe, it was quite obvious to us that it was going to leak, but we went through the exercise anyway, and it did leak. Uh, we conducted the same leakage test, which is done with air, pressurised air, on the copper press fit, and it did not leak. Um, so uh, that indicated to us uh, that obviously we had to introduce additional safety requirements uh, around installations with multi-layer pipe. So what are the solutions for this issue. So where multi-layer pipe is installed, um, multi-layer pipe installations must include a means of isolating the gas supply in the event of a fire emergency. Uh, one way that you can achieve this, uh, and particularly in large multi-storey buildings, in, is, in, is to install a class one uh, safety shutoff valve that conforms to AS4629. Um, as close as practicable to the gas supply point to the building. Uh, the valve will isolate the gas supply when an active fire safety system, and there is that definition that I referred to before, uh, when it operates, for example, a sprinkler system or a fire alarm. Um, and the system must provide pressure proving before the gas supply is restored downstream. Now, in Class 1A buildings, in other words, residential buildings or detached or multi-unit dwellings in New Zealand, um, it's not uh, very practical to be installing Class 1 automatic shutoff valves. And in most cases, you won't have a fire safety system in a residential building that you can interlock to an automatic shutoff valve. So there are other solutions. Um, the standard does allow for devices that shut off the gas supply by sensing uh, excessive flow uh, or sensing a drop of pressure. So the example shown on the screen here is uh, what's known as an excess flow device. Um, so uh, essentially, if you had a rupture of the multi-layer pipe as a result of a fire um, and you had the uncontrolled release of gas, then effectively what the excess flow device does is that it senses that there's excessive flow and it shuts the gas off to the building uh, thereby uh, not further fueling the fire. Um, as you can see from the photograph on the right hand side, um, the excess flow devices can be um, with an adapter connected directly to the outlet of a gas billing meter. Um, now, the interesting thing about these valves is that uh, they will reset automatically when the pressure on both sides of the valve has equalised. So, in other words, once you fix the leak um, and pressurise both sides of that valve, it will reset itself. Um, another solution is an under-pressure shutoff device, um, otherwise known as an UPSO. Uh, so, UPSOs will isolate the gas supply uh, at a predetermined pressure drop and typically are required to be manually reset. Uh, some more information on multi-layer pipe uh, and semi-rigid connectors. So clause 661 uh, of the standard 
uh, now says that multi-layer and plastics coated semi-rigid stainless steel piping uh, that is not a certified semi-rigid connector cannot be used as a final connection to an appliance and must terminate at least one metre from an appliance to prevent any heat damage. So we've seen examples of uh, either multi-layer pipe or plastic coated semi-rigid stainless steel piping that is not certified as a semi-rigid connector um, being installed uh, similar to what you see on the in the diagram, or sorry, the photo on the left-hand side there. And the concern obviously is the heat generated uh, depending on the type of gas appliance and the impact that that could have on the consumer piping. I must stress that if you are uh, using semi-rigid stainless steel tubing to connect an appliance, and if it is a certified semi-rigid connector, then you can use it for connecting to a gas appliance. Um, another new requirement, uh, clause 5.2.12 uh, relates to brazing. Um, so we now prohibit brazing within one metre uh, of a joint with non-metallic components. Uh, it's important to note uh, that there may be specific requirements that manufacturers also require when brazing or silver sol soldering is being carried out. Um, clause 5 to 12 now includes the prohibition of brazing or silver soldering within one metre from those non-metallic components. Um, what uh, many uh, plumbers and gas fitters used to do previously uh, in situations like this is they'd get a, a wet rag um, and they would uh, position that wet rag sort of downstream of the piping so as to absorb the heat. Um, that's Although it seemed like a crude sort of way to go about it, uh, it did seem to be an effective uh, way of preventing overheating of non-metallic components. Um, but nevertheless, you could never guarantee that you're always going to get the same outcome depending on, um, you know, how it was done. So uh, we uh, the regulators actually undertook some testing um, uh, at one of the uh, NADA accredited laboratories uh, and actually uh, had one of the laboratories do some um, uh, some some oxyacetylene uh, welding and uh, took some te temperature measurements across uh, some copper piping uh, over a range of distances and different sizes and were able to determine from those test results that one metre uh, appeared to be um, uh, uh, the suitable distance that would guarantee that you wouldn't get any uh, overheating or damage to non-metallic components. We've also introduced uh, under clause 5314 uh, a number of new drawings. Now, some of you that uh, work in uh, as plumbers in the uh, in the water side uh, of things, as as opposed to gas fitting. Uh, would be familiar with these drawings. And the reason for that is that these drawings were taken straight out of the uh, 3500 series of standards that plumbers use uh, for water plumbing. Um, so we've taken these drawings and adopted them into ASNZS uh, 5601 part one. Uh, the changes have been made, to the requirements for installing pipes in wooden joists or metal frame walls. Previously, there were limited requirements in relation to this issue, um, but following a review, as I said, of the 3500 series of standards, the same di si diagrams uh, have now been uh, introduced into 5601 part one. Um, so these figures have been included to help explain uh, the requirements for both uh, wood and steel frames. Um, and uh, the requirements in clause 5314 state the location and maximum size of holes to be drilled when uh, installing a fitting line. Uh, now, cookers, this is an interesting one. Uh, so up until now, uh, gas fitters would be familiar with um, uh, the clearance from a cooker to an overhead range hood. 
uh, and that would typically be 600 millimetres. Um, at one stage, that measurement was taken from the hob. Um, later on, when the 2013 edition of 5601 Part 1 was published, uh, that reference point became from the top of the highest burner. Um, but we were seeing a lot of conflict out in the, in the market. Uh, and the conflict arose because um, the Rangehood manufacturers, and especially those Rangehood manufacturers uh, that were located in Europe, uh, they designed their range hoods based on the international IEC standard for range hoods. And those, uh, the, the, the standard for range hoods uh, in Europe essentially requires a 650 millimeter clearance um, to gas cooking appliances. So what we would see in the, uh, in the industry is we would see a conflict whereby we'd have the instructions for the cooking appliance saying 600 and then you'd have the range of instructions saying 650 and so the gas fitter and the electrician would have an argument about what would was the required clearance. So what we've decided to do is to align the clearance requirements uh, for gas cooking appliances with the IC standard for range hoods. So we've increased the clearance from 600 to 650 most importantly, though, what we did not want to do is for existing installations, we did not want to create a situation where previously, because 600 clearance was uh, accepted, uh, we didn't want to create a situation where if you change the cooker over, that a consumer would have to uh, redesign their whole kitchen. So we made it quite clear in the standard that where you're confronted with a situation like that, uh, that you can install a cooker at a 600 millimetre clearance, uh, in other words, based on the previous cooker's clearance. So you uh, would have a look at what uh, that clearance was from the cooker that was being replaced and apply that to the new cooker. Uh, that's so that, you know, uh, as I said, consumers wouldn't have to go to the trouble of um, redesigning their kitchens. Um, if it is a new installation, completely new installation, new kitchen, the expectation is 650 millimetres. And irrespective of all of that, if the manufacturer's instructions specify a greater clearance, um, then you have to install in accordance with those manufacturer's instructions. Uh, clause 6.10.2.8. So now there is a restriction on semi-rigid connectors for commercial catering equipment. So semi-rigid connectors can now only be connected to commercial catering equipment if the app appliance is permanently fixed and if the connector is protected from damage. Um, the main reason for this is that... Um, the semi-rigid connectors that were previously known as uh, limited flexibility connectors, um, when they are tested and certified, they undergo a flexing test. Uh, that flexing test consists of 30 cycles of flexing um, the semi-rigid connector. That's as opposed to a hose assembly, which you often see connected to commercial catering equipment. Hose assemblies typically undergo seven and a half thousand uh, cycles uh, in in a flexibility uh, uh, endurance test or fe flexibility durability test. Um, so thirty cycles, as you can appreciate, is not very much. Um, and the concern is that with a lot of commercial catering equipment, especially when you have to get to the back of the appliance to clean behind the appliance, if the appliance can be moved, if you do that often enough then the potential exists for the semi-rigid connector to fatigue and eventually snap, causing a leak. Um, so that's why the requirement for semi-rigid connectors has now been restricted to where appliances are fixed. Um, fluing into a roof space. So up until the 2022 edition in Australia, you were allowed to flue a gas appliance into a roof space. Uh, it has been prohibited in New Zealand for quite some time. Uh, so the committee looked at that and basically uh, came to the conclusion that it, 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 and nowadays, especially with energy efficient homes, uh, and especially with even roof spaces becoming uh, more and more energy efficient, less ventilation in roof spaces. 
um, the committee came to the conclusion that that the requirement that existed for New Zealand should also apply uh, to Australia. So you are no longer allowed to um, to vent or flue an appliance flue into a roof space. So you have to flue through the roof uh, space area into the outside atmosphere. Another uh, new requirement relates to um, the protection of combustible surfaces uh, and in particular adjacent to commercial catering appliances. So many of you that would be familiar with uh, the requirements for protecting combustible surfaces uh, would be familiar that uh, uh, typically the uh, protective material that you would use would have to be at least six millimetres thick and have a maximum coefficient of heat transfer of 20 watts per metre squared Kelvin. Um, what we actually found out in the field over the course of a number of years is that on certain commercial catering appliances, in particular appliances like brat pans, uh, deep fryers, uh, where you've got flueways at the back of the appliance uh, and you've got uh, combustion products coming or discharging uh, from those flueways, scrubbing perhaps onto a stainless steel splashback. We found that even if you had fire resistant board behind uh, the stainless steel splashback at the six millimeter thickness, that we were still getting uh, pyrolysis occurring of any timber frame that sat behind uh, that fire resistant material. So uh, what we did through a lot of testing um, with two laboratories that are accredited to do uh, this type of testing, we uh, established what the minimum criteria would be for commercial catering equipment that I just described that would prevent um, combustible surfaces from, uh, from overheating uh, and potentially catching fire. So essentially what that means is that if you're wanting to uh, if you can't provide the minimum clearance specified in the manufacturer's instructions for a commercial catering appliance and you have to use uh, fire-resistant material, then uh, in the case of commercial catering equipment, you've got to choose a, uh, a material that has a minimum thickness of 15 millimetres and a maximum heat transfer coefficient of 7.5 watts per metre squared Kelvin. Okay, so we've got new pipe sizing tables and graphs. So the previous pipe sizing tables um, from 2004 up into 2013 uh, were based upon uh, what was called the National Fuel Gas Code. Um, now, uh, what happened when uh, those tables changed in 2004 was we had a lot of feedback uh, in the, the tables uh, became a lot more conservative in uh, 2013 than what they had been prior to that, um, which meant that uh, buildings, in particular complex gas installations that used large piping diameters and long piping runs, would have to use larger size piping, and that increased the cost, overall cost uh, of, a, of, a, of construction. Um, so we had a look at uh, the methodology that was used for the pipe sizing tables and pipe sizing graphs and the national fuel ga uh, gas code. Um, and we decided to look at another methodology, uh, which I won't go into the details, uh, but it, it, essentially it's called the Churchill friction factor equation that was used for the new methodology. Ultimately, what that ended up doing was that uh, the flow capacities in the pipe sizing tables and graphs didn't change very much for small pipe diameters and shorter runs, but did change uh, significantly for those large, larger piping diameters uh, and, and longer runs. Uh, and they changed from the point of view of being less conservative and more in tune or more in line with uh, the flow capacities uh, that, uh, that one saw prior to the publication of the 2013 uh, standard. Um, and we basically liaised with a lot of builders uh, throughout that process and they were very happy 
with those changes because essentially it meant that they could go back to what they were doing uh, previously with uh, those larger complex jobs and obviously that reduced the cost of construction. In Appendix K, which is informative, uh, we have introduced uh, an additional clause, which is a general rule of thumb uh, around the effect of altitude. Um, and obviously this will impact on high rise buildings. So as a general rule of thumb for natural gas, uh, the pressure will increase by approximately half a kPa for every 100 metre rise in altitude. Um, if you were to have a multi-storey building that was using propane, uh, it would actually be the opposite. So what you'd find is you'd get a decrease in pressure of about 0.7 kPa for every 100 metre increase in altitude of the building. And um, so in Australia, you'd be using propane. Um, if you're in New Zealand and you're using LP gas, it would be in the form of butane. Um, and the decrease there would be uh, even, even greater at 1.3 kPa for every 100 metre rise in altitude. So if you do work uh, with gas fitting in high rise buildings, that's something that you be, need to uh, be mindful of and take into consideration. Um, flue terminals under covered areas in a recess or on a balcony. So we've introduced new requirements and a new diagram um, so essentially we now require that if you've got an appliance like continuous flow water heater that has a flue diverter as shown in the left and right hand side diagrams, um, that those flue diverters have to discharge um, through the open side of course, but it has to be such that uh, the flue diverter cannot be blocked, right? So the outlet of the flue diverter has to extend beyond any uh, open side of a building um, and probably well both the diagram on the left and the diagram on the right give you a bit of an indication of what we mean by that. Um, the photograph in the middle uh, no doubt explains why we've brought in this requirement. So we were seeing a lot of this type of scenario where you've got a continuous flow water heater on a balcony uh, installed by a gas fitter legally and then afterwards you would have uh, the consumer they would get someone to come along and install some exterior blinds essentially making that a, a closed off area uh, resulting in a dangerous situation with a build-up of carbon monoxide so with these new requirements now if you can imagine if someone wanted to put in some curtains after the fact uh, they could still do that, but they would have to uh, have the curtains designed in such a way so that uh, they would not interfere with the flue diverter that would be protruding out from that point where those curtains are currently sitting. Isolation of Education Institutions, Clause 5291. So uh, in installations where a number of appliances without a flame safeguard systems are used, such as school laboratories, a means of isolation shall now be fitted uh, and include all of the following, a readily accessible quarter turn manual isolation valve at the inlet of the installation, an electrically operated solenoid valve to supply gas to the installation. The valve shall be controlled by a timing device set to the duration uh, the installation is expected to operate. A readily accessible emergency stop button connected to the ele electrically operated valve with a key operated reset function to ensure that no gas flows to the installation after restoration of power following uh, a power failure. Signage adjacent to the emergency stop button indicating its purpose. Uh, operating instructions for the emergency stop button and the system is, uh, shall require pressure proving of the downstream installation prior to the restoration of the gas supply. Commercial kitchen isolation. So where more than one commercial catering appliance is to be connected, um, either of the following uh, shall apply. You can either have a single quarter turn manual shutoff valve uh, installed to isolate all appliances. Uh, the manual shutoff valve 
has to be readily accessible. In other words, has to be accessed without the use of a tool and clearly identified. Um, or you can have a readily accessible emergency stop button, which is clearly identified by a notice. Um, and it, it shall be connected to an electrically operated valve with a key operated reset function to ensure that no gas flows to the installation after restoration of power follow, following a power failure. Um, so in the note, there's some suggested wording for the notice uh, is gas isolation, but on the right-hand side there, you can see um, through the photograph some examples of what would be deemed to be acceptable uh, solutions. Under cooker connections for freestanding commercial catering equipment, uh, clause 610110. So uh, the photo on the left-hand side uh, shows a compliant installation under the 2022 edition. Uh, so you can connect, uh, but not using a hose assembly, right? So we've had plenty of examples as shown on the right-hand side where gas fitters have used hose assemblies and um, that particular photo is a relatively uh, good one, to be honest, uh, given some of the photographs that I've seen of some uh, uh, how some of these hose assemblies um, are installed under commercial catering equipment. Um, you know, uh, I've seen plenty of examples of where hoses have been kinked, damaged, um, covered in grease, um, just looped, uh, looped uh, multiple times, uh, caught underneath the feet of uh, commercial catering appliances. So essentially that is no longer permitted. Um, so freestanding uh, commercial catering equipment hose assemblies. So then there are now specific requirements for the connection of freestanding commercial catering equipment using a hose assembly. Um, the clause 61027 now requires the hose assembly to hang in a U-shape. The hose assemblies are required to be either class B or D. Uh, means to prevent damage to the hose and assembly will, will now also be required. Um, and the regulators see a high level of non-compliance in this area, uh, which initiated the change to the standards. Um, uh, so in the future, you know, regulators will be taking, you know, a zero tolerance uh, policy with regards to the, the, these types of installations. Okay. Um, so clearances to grease filters. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, to note here. So the column on the left-hand side, the heat source to uh, grease filters. Um, so we've now changed the description um, by adding this column in the left-hand side that, that refers to low-intensity flames, permanently concealed flames, uh, naked flames and intense naked flames. And that's consistent with the standard AS 1668 Part 2, uh, which is the standard is used in the building industry for, um, for the extraction of um, or air movement and extraction of combustion products in commercial kitchens. So we've essentially aligned uh the uh the the clearance table with the existing requirements in as 1668 part two uh, which is incidentally referenced in 5601 part one um the other thing that we have looked at is target tops uh so target tops previously uh were a uh 13 50 clearance uh they're now a 10 50 clearance so that's something that is uh, worth taking into consideration as well. Uh, and we did that on the basis of looking at uh, the way in which those appliances are operated, where essentially they are a solid plate, but they also have removable um, plates, uh, semicircular plates that, uh, with, with, um, with essentially large ring burners underneath that can be used for cooking as well. Um, 
another thing to take into consideration in, regarding clearances to uh, commercial grease filters uh, is that um, the clause is not limited to grease filters located directly above commercial catering appliances, uh, but rather incorporates any part of any grease filter which is within the minimum required exclusion area as depicted by the picture shown on, on the screen there. So um, when you are uh, installing commercial catering appliances, you need to be mindful of not just the appliance that you're installing, but the appliances uh, that are directly adjacent to that, or if you're installing multiple appliances at the one time and they're all adjacent to each other, you need to take that into consideration um, when you're uh, looking at grease filter clearances. Okay, so I think uh, that is it from me in terms of the presentation. Um, so I see we've got about just under 15 minutes or 14 minutes to go. So, uh, John, I might hand over back to you. Fantastic, Enzo. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Um, we do have uh, quite a few questions um, that have come through the, the Slido. The, the QR code has been appearing um, throughout the, uh, your presentation. Um, the first question uh, from Steve, Steve Hall. Uh, could you please clarify the excess flow val valve rules? Uh, many variations, many various thoughts around this subject are being circulated as to where they should be installed. Obviously at the meter, but are we to install them at every branch? Now, Enzo, you spoke about this earlier in the presentation, I believe, clause 5.2 part 11. Yeah, that's that's right, uh, John. Look, uh, the first thing to say about excess flow valves, to make it very clear, is that they are only applicable to Class 1A buildings, uh, residential buildings. Um, so the expectation is that um, not not to use them in, in high-rise buildings. Um, in terms of where they can be installed, they can be installed at the meter. Um, there, there are a couple of issues to take into consideration with excess flow valves. Depending on um, the uh, size of the installation, uh, so if you've got a very long fitting line and you've got, um, you know, pressure drops, significant pressure drops across the fitting line, so you might start off with 32 mil pipe and you might transition all the way down to 15 mil pipe. Uh, if you have a fire at the other end of the house and the 15 mil pipe catches fire, um, then the excess flow valve at the gas meter is not going to see that excess flow uh, until you know the, the fire has progressed significantly to the larger pipe sizing. Um, so uh, what the manufacturers typically say, and you do have to refer to the manufacturer's instructions for the excess flow valves, is that you can install them uh, at the, the branch takeoff points to appliances, uh, for example, in a roof space. However, if you do do that, you have to be mindful of the fact that by installing an excess flow valve, you're now introducing a mechanical joint. And you have to refer to clause 538 for um, concealed piping um, and mechanical joints and also clause 5312 in particular, which uh, has the requirements for the ventilation of concealed locations. The AG6 committee is doing some additional work on this as we speak in terms of providing further clarity. Um, so essentially, if you are going to use excess flow valves, you do have to, uh, if you're going to put them in the roof space, you do have to make sure that you have the required ventilation because it is a concealed area. Um, the other alternative to doing that is to, e to upsize all your, con your consumer piping uh, if you're using multi-layer pipe such that you don't have those pressure losses and you can get away with just having... Uh, the one valve at the meter. And if that's not an option for you, there's always the option of using alternative consumer piping uh, like copper press fit or just standard copper. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And it looks like we have uh, a follow-up as well. Um, uh, do, uh, do the excess flow valves affect the pipe sizing calculations? 
as the orifice in them is considerably smaller than the bore of the pipe? Uh, yes, the, question, the answer to that question is yes. So typically excess flow valves have a pressure drop across them of, of about 50 pascals. So we've looked at um, there's, there's about three manufacturers that, uh, that we've been uh, looking at. Um, I won't name them obviously, but um, there's three that we're aware of uh, that supply um, mainly the European market. Um, uh, they all seem to perform relatively the same in terms of their tripping points, uh, which uh, is about 1.3 to 1.45, their nominal value. Um, and they all seem to have the same sort of pressure drop of about 50 pascals. So this is something you need to take into consideration. And you also obviously need to take into consideration the pipe sizing tables from uh, the supplier of the multi-layer pipe. Fantastic. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, with the building energy efficiency requirements and rules required with flueless gas space heaters located internally, uh, why don't we um, omit uh, bayonet points being installed internally and just allow flued space heaters to be installed internally? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, from a Victorian perspective, uh, what I can say is that uh, in Victoria, we prohibited uh, or banned the installation of flueless space heaters through legislation back in uh, 2008. Uh, we do allow for, in Victoria, the replacement of an existing LPG flueless space heater with a new flueless space heater that meets uh, class one emissions uh, uh, ratings. Um, but to the point of the question, uh, it is true that houses are becoming more and more energy efficient. And so flueless space heaters require ventilation um, as do open fluid gas heaters, mind you. Um, and so they're really, I think the market is market driven. I think you'll find that what will happen is more so than through the standard itself, but through market driven forces, you'll find that people will uh, gravitate towards room sealed appliances as opposed to either flueless space heaters or open fluid gas space heaters. Okay, great. Um, Jason asks, with the uh, fluing into roof space prohibited, what do we do with flueless vents as they are usually vented into roof space? Uh, so through flueless vents, I'm assuming we're talking about um, flueless vents for flueless space heaters. Uh, well, look for new installations, uh, essentially you won't be able to vent into a roof space anymore for existing installations. You still won't be able to vent into a roof space anymore um, uh, if you're doing a new installation of a flueless space heater. Um, so what you'll have to do is if you're going to uh, have a vent in a ceiling, you will have to duct that into the outside atmosphere or alternatively you'll have to go through uh, a, a, a uh, the, the wall, so a high level uh, vent in the wall. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question, um, also from from Jason. Um, when installing gas, gas PEX pipes, uh, do we install excess flow valves on the new installation only, or do we need to install on all existing gas PEX pipes? Very good question, Jason. So. Uh, Predominantly, so that the standard is not retrospective, so um, it does not apply to existing installations. However, if you were to modify an existing installation, for example, you decided to extend uh, a, a home by adding an extra room uh, and you decided to use multi-layer pipe uh, for that extension, then you would have to meet the new requirements. 
Um, but if uh, if that were not the case, then then obviously you wouldn't have to worry about it. But yeah, uh, the other the other thing to point out w- with regards to that is if you are changing over an appliance in an existing building or an existing home, so you're changing over a cooker, that does not constitute a modification of the consumer piping, and that does not trigger uh, clause five to eleven. Right, so you don't have to introduce excess flow valves if, for example, you come along and decide, uh, or the customer decides they want to change their um, their gas ducted heater, or their gas cooker, or their gas space heater, or gas water heater, whatever it might be. That is not a trigger for inter- the introduction of excess flow valves because you're not actually modifying the consumer piping itself. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm very conscious um, of of time, so maybe if we uh, wrap up with just one more question, I will thank everybody for for posting your questions um, in in the Slido. Um, <clears throat> I say, if if you'd like uh, those questions answered, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, as I say, my details are on, are on the website, and we can make sure that we we follow up with you. Um, so the uh, the last question is. Um, if coming across from a class 1A building, uh, non-compliant to clause 5.3.16, uh, location of multi-layer piping 6.6.1 restrictions on appliance connection when carrying out gas work, uh, clauses 5.2.11 and 5.2.12 will be additionally required to make the site compliant. Uh, i.e. Uh, LP gas regulator replacement. Yeah, not not quite sure what that particular question is uh, getting at, uh, but I, yeah, I, I'd have to say that um, ultimately uh, it's suggesting non-compliance to clause 5.3.16 yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'll have to take that one. Uh, um, uh, I'll have to take that one on notice and come back to um, to the person that asked that question because I need to understand the question a little bit more. It's not, yeah, not absolutely. quite too clear to me. A, a fantastic opportunity for um, everyone to reach out to me um, if you do have any sort of follow up questions. Um, as I say, the committee is meeting over the next couple of days, as I said earlier. So um, a really good opportunity for uh, um, for, yeah, for you to get in touch um, and we can reach out if, if need be. Um, so which I think brings us to, to a close. Um, thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for, for your attendance um, this afternoon and this evening. Um, we really hope you enjoyed and found the presentation um, informative. Um, uh, very big thank you once again to, to Enzo um, for giving up your time um, to present to everybody. Um, <clears throat> as I say, any follow-up questions, any comments or feedback, please feel free to, to reach out to us um, at, at Stanis Australia. Um, and with that, thank you very much indeed um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. <laughs>